Hey, what's going on, everybody? Jamel Gibbs here. Welcome to another podcast episode. Listen, we have a very special guest on the line. Uh, you may know him through YouTube. You may know him through 100percentfinance.com. But we have the one, the only, my man, Juan Pablo. What's up, man? Hey, what's going on? Thanks for having me. Oh, man, it's a, it's a pleasure. Now, we did a podcast episode uh, not so long ago. You guys can check that out on iTunes. You can check it out on Spotify, any of the uh, podcast platforms. I want you guys to check out that podcast and you'll be able to listen to this one as well. This is going to be the sequel to that particular podcast. We didn't get the video version of that podcast. Uh, so we decided to, to, to do another one for YouTube. So this is the YouTube exclusive for you guys. And we're going to talk about uh, residential real estate investing today in the form of apartment investing, okay? So what, what I really want to talk about is that one to four, maybe up to six unit apartment investing, uh, something feasible for brand new real estate investors or uh, experienced investors that's looking to make that transition over into the apartment game to build up some passive income. We understand how important passive income is uh, in your real estate investing business. At the end of the day, most of you guys are wholesalers, right? Or maybe you're in the rehab world. Maybe you're looking to get started with investing. At the end of the day, you're going to need to build passive income. I spent years of my life grinding, hustling away, deal after deal, realizing that I'm only as good as my last deal when I wholesale houses. So yes, you can get rich wholesaling houses, but you will never get wealthy wholesaling houses. You will never become wealthy wholesaling. You need to build passive income. And the only way to do that in the real estate world, well, there's a couple of different ways, but the best way to do it is through acquiring properties for long-term capital. OK, and understanding that you do the work one time and you can get paid from that one time of doing the work many times over by collecting rent every single month. And my man Juan Pablo is a specialist in this area. And we're going to talk about what he's doing in his business and how you guys can implement it as well. So, Juan, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, man? Oh, thanks. Thanks for that. I uh, appreciate that. So yeah, I'm Juan Pablo. I'm a real estate investor. I started investing in real estate in 2010, right after the crash, right? The real estate crash. And it was somewhat of a, a perfect storm, meaning uh, some interest rates were low. The property values were a tad bit lower than usual, but you had to make sure you qualify for the financing. And at the time, prior to buying my first property in 2010, I had bad credit and have any money. So I worked on improving my credit and I used creative financing to acquire multi-unit properties. So it came to a situation in which it's my third year of investing and my goal was to quit my day job at 30 years old and I was 29. So I felt like Kobe in the fourth quarter, right? Uh, crunch time. And I realized that if I continue to buy single family properties, it will take me a much longer time to have enough passive income that exceeded my paycheck so I can quit my day job. So then I realized at that moment, I needed to switch uh, strategies as well as switch what type of properties that I purchase. So I, I switched from buying single family properties using my savings to buying multi-unit properties using creative financing. So I've acquired a lot more properties using business credit, seller financing, private money as well, whether that's uh, private lenders or that's equity partners and so forth. So then that year uh, before my 30th birthday, I was able to acquire uh, an additional 21 units instead of my goal of 10, only because I just switched gears and just went multi-units. So when we're talking about creative real estate investing, um, you know, for those of you who don't know what creative real estate investing is, you want to explain what, exactly what, 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 what you mean by creative real estate investing? One. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so there's more than one way to skin the cat, right? Creative just means there's more than outside of the traditional, conventional means of buying a property. Like traditionally speaking, 
most investors still do a residential mortgage on a single family house, put a 20% down payment down. You know, the mortgage may be amortized over 30 years, uh, interest rate by the time it's reported, maybe 5% and so forth, right? That's just the standard way of using investment capitals. But you'll come to a point as a result of the secondary mortgage market, that's uh, Fannie and Freddie, they cap you out of how many mortgages you can buy for investment purposes, right? In some cases, you might be capped at four. In other cases, you may be capped at by nine. So anything over nine different properties, they will not provide you with any funding. So if you come across that situation, you're faced with two options. Option one is, all right, well, I guess I'll stop investing, right? Being that the secondary mortgage market, then they buy mortgages from the banks. Like, for example, Bank of America may give you a mortgage, but then Fannie and Freddie, they'll just, they're the secondary mortgage market in which they'll package a bunch of mortgages together and sell it off. Okay. So, so they have a lot of guidelines and regulations as a result. So that's the first option is, okay, do nothing. You, you, met, you met the cap, buy no properties. But savvy investors, on the other hand, they're not going to let that stop them, right? One monkey don't stop no show. So you have to be creative. So how can I still acquire properties that, in which I can overcome that, that limitation? So there's many ways, as I shared a few seconds ago, of skinning that cat, right? One way is, okay, well, you can buy a property using uh, commercial mortgages. So that's the beauty of, of acquiring uh, multifamily properties. When you buy a property that has more than five units, that's considered commercial. Now, commercial mortgage lenders, they play by a different set of rules, a different ball game, in other words, than residential mortgage companies. In fact, they can care less out of how many properties you can own, as long as the property is profitable. Because with commercial, 80% of their underwriting, meaning how they qualify you for the mortgage, is based upon the property, the cash flow, the return, the built-in equity, and so forth. And then 20% is based on the borrower. So they may want to see your credit. They may want to see your financials, like your personal financial statement, tax returns. But the majority of their emphasis is on the property. But when you do residential, it's the exact opposite. 80% of a residential mortgage lender, their focus is on you, the borrower. I want to see your tax returns for the past three years. I want to see your pay stubs for the past three months. I want to see your bank statements for the past three months. Hey, what's up with this hard inquiry you got on your credit report two days ago? Do you get financing? If so, give me a letter of explanation. Some of you guys may know what I'm talking about. Oh, where does the deposit come from in your bank account? Is this a gift? Oh, you got it from your mom? Oh, you know what? She needs to write a letter of explanation explaining this deposit. A yeah, ton yeah. Of paperwork. yeah, it's a ton of paperwork with yeah. residential. Of course, you, got it. you might get started with residential, but don't stay there. Do enough residential properties to the point you qualify for commercial and then you can get more creative because commercial, they also allow seller financing. You mentioned last time we spoke, you mentioned that you felt like you were holding yourself back at one point and then you uh, got into uh, your first 20 units and then you scaled from that point forward. Uh, what made you feel like you were holding yourself back at that point? Oh, it was mainly mindset because... Uh, the mindset I had starting out was the mindset of a self-employed person. Uh, I, I said I could, I say self-employed, not a landlord, because self-employed is a mindset that could relate to any business, right? You can be a self-employed wholesaler, you can be a self-employed restaurant owner, you can be a self-employed real estate investor. We we call it a landlord, meaning you're doing everything from sweeping the front porch to changing the locks, to providing eviction notices, to collecting the rent, to showing the unit to another tenant, to screening the tenant, to uh, going to the courthouse for evictions. You're doing everything under the sun. You're everything from the CEO to the janitor. Yep. And eventually you get burned out, right? You might buy two or three properties and being that you're doing every single task under the sun, you don't have enough energy to buy anymore. So you just cap yourself out of just a few properties. In my case, I had three properties. I had a duplex, a single family, and then I had a fourplex. So that's seven units in total, but that's three properties. And I was getting burnt out. And then I had a shift in mindset in, in regard to, you know what? I need to stop having this self-employed mindset, thinking like a landlord, and be more of an entrepreneur. 
an entrepreneur creates systems and teams. Right. Just like you, for example, I understand you do wholesaling, but I'm sure you're not, you, maybe you might occasionally, but I'm sure on your day to day, you're not driving for dollars. You're not sending out direct mail yourself, licking the stamp. More than likely, you have teams and systems to do that for you. Right. So it's the same thing you want to implement in regard to buying rental properties as well. How can I have systems and teams set up so that I can continually buy properties and automate the amount of capital I need on a consistent basis where it demands little to none of my time? You got to make it pass it yourself. That's right. That way you can scale. That's right, man. And you know, I was just recently talking with a friend of mine who mentioned he's actually making more money on smaller apartments than he is on the larger apartments. Is that the case with you as well? Yeah, that seems to be my sweet spot. So I know big numbers are sexy. You know, people mm -hmm. want the 100 units, the 1,000 units. Don't get me wrong. It's sexy. I get it. But based upon the market that I invest in, 43% of the housing market is comprised of multi-unit properties. And they typically tend to be sized from a range of five units to about 20. So that's my sweet spot. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just a, a type of deal that I know like the back of my hand. Like, and that's one thing I want to share too with, with, the, with the audience is uh, zero in on, on one strategy, on one type of property. You don't have to try this process and then that strategy and then do flips and then buying holes and then single family and multifamily. I stuck to one metric. Five units and up, between five and 20 units, 10% cap rate, 10% cash on cash return, about $30,000 per unit to buy it, right? I want to make sure it's $30,000 per unit, meaning if I'm on a five unit, that should be worth $150,000. Mm -hmm. okay? And I made sure that I bought it in Pittsburgh or Harrisburg and in neighboring suburbs. So that was my criteria. If it was anything else that didn't meet that metric, I didn't entertain it. So it's right. zero per end, so it makes it easier to scale it because you're using a, a systematized approach. It's a standard process that you can implement. And so that way, when you're training a team to invest on your behalf, it'll be easier to train them. So let's take a step back for a moment. First and foremost, I kind of want to give everybody a step-by-step -step process to this entire thing. So what we're focusing on right now are smaller apartment units. You mentioned between five and 20 units total, right? Mm -hmm. Zero in on exactly what you guys, that was one big takeaway right there. Zero in on what it is that you want to focus on and stick with it. There's too many uh, shiny objects out there for you guys to look at and attract your attention. You know, one day you might be interested in wholesaling. The other day you might be interested in rehab. And then you might see the shiny object of the huge apartments. What Juan is saying is focus on one thing. Put the blinders on. Understand exactly what you want and then stick with it and become great at the one thing. If you decide to add something else into the equation later, then that's completely enti that's entirely up to you. But you, you're only gonna be successful by focusing on the one thing that you actually want and working toward it. That's actually a book by Gary Keller, the owner of uh, Keller Williams. Wow. A book called The One Thing. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> he talks about that too. Even though he's, of course, he's a real estate guy, right? He owns like one of the biggest realty companies out there, but he's the mm -hmm. author. And outside of him writing real estate books, he actually writes books on focus and productivity. You got to focus on the one thing. And it's right. hard. Trust me, being an entrepreneur, you, wanna, you have that shiny object syndrome. You want to be able to do everything. You think you do it all, but you just got to zero down and just simplify, 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 because you have to think broader as I share as an entrepreneur mindset. Your right. system is going to be so simple that you can hire Joe Blow off the street to do it, right? It's just like McDonald's or any other fast food franchise. That particular franchise is ran by a bunch of teenagers. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, uh, they don't have PhDs. They don't, they don't have years worth of training. It's probably their first job, but they're able to, of course they make mistakes, don't get me wrong, but they're able to successfully operate a business off the strength of teenagers. Right. That's how simplified you want your processes to be. And it's hard to simplify a uh, process when you have so much other businesses and products going on at once. So many different markets you're investing in, so many different types of deals you're working with, so many different type of uh, lead generation strategies. You're doing direct mail, you're doing driving for dollars, you're doing yellow postcards, you're, you're cold calling. It's extremely different. You're working with agents, you're partnering with other wholesalers. All those strategies work, 
but you got to zero in and automate one first. And then once you get that on autopilot, then you can go to the next. Let's go a little deeper into this. So if we wanted to provide our listeners with a step-by-step process, right? We understand we're focusing on five to 20 units at this point. We want to start building a team in order to be able to acquire these units, uh, ultimately leading us into passive income. What would you say would be a five-step process to get from point A to point Z in, in that equation? All right, if you want that five-step process, you got to cash at me first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <that's fine. laughs> okay, I get it. All right, so if, if you want a, a simple process to get it from A to Z, you mean from going from not owning a property to owning a property? Yeah, so and, and then having some of the systems and processes put in place to be able to do it as well. Okay, great, great. So I'll give you a five-step process, right? First process, and I'll give you just a, a general overview, not going nitty-gritty in depth Mm -hmm. but the first phase we actually break it down to phases phase one is find the money meaning when you're buying multi-unit properties instead of doing like how most investors do they find a property first get on the contract and then they start running around like a chicken with his head cut off trying to find the money when you take that route sometimes uh Agents and wholesalers may not want to work with you. Like, for example, right, you being a wholesaler, if you get a property under contract with an end buyer and you find out that they don't got the money and they're broke, they lose credibility in your eyes, right? So the first phase is find the money. How are you going to finance this deal? As I shared, there's different creative financing strategies. You use a seller financing, you're using a conventional or residential mortgage, or you're using business credit, or you're using partners. How are you financing? So the first phase is find the money. Second phase, find the deal. You want to find a cash flowing property that's in a safe neighborhood with good returns, with the potential to increase the value. That's what I mean by a deal, right? Because when you ask most people, well, does it look like a deal? is that a good deal? They, they don't know what a, a deal means. Hey, the seller said they'll give me 50% seller financing. Is that a good deal? Well, how can you determine that, right? What makes a deal a good deal is the cash flow, the cash on cash return, the safe neighborhood, and the potential to increase the value. Okay, so find the deal is the second phase. The third phase is perform due diligence. Just because you see a good deal, right? You got those numbers like, whoa, hey, Juan, it has a great cash and cash return. Oh man, the cash flow is sweet. And it's in a, a really good market. It's an emerging market even. So the appreciation is, 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 is coming. Even though it may look good on paper, you have to verify all that stuff. You have to verify the rents. You have to verify the expenses. You have to verify the financials. And you have to verify the state or the condition of the property. It might be a good deal on paper, but there could be a huge issue with the sewer system. So as soon as you buy that property, you have a humongous repair to do or as eat, or the extreme water bill as a result of that sewer issue, the water bill is eating away at your cash flow. So you got to perform due diligence. So that's phase three. Phase four is close. Are you going to close remotely in person? You got to check out that settlement statement, make sure it's accurate. Uh, did you negotiate credits at closing or cash back at closing? Are you going to manage it yourself or are you going to outsource it to property management? Okay. And do you, are you going to get all the hard copies of the leases and service contracts? Like you have a contract for snow removal, cutting a lawn, wherever your property is located, stuff like that. And so that's four phases so far. And then the fifth phase is repeat. So you want to repeat this process every six months minimum. So you find the money, you find the deal, perform due diligence, close, repeat. If you do that, the five-step process, every six months, you can obtain enough rental properties in your portfolio in your spare time to be able to quit your nine to five. And how do you get your team to be able to take care of those processes for you? Excellent point. question. So uh, just to give you some firsthand information, so obviously I did start off bootstrapping my way up to success. So I was doing it all. You know, I was a janitor and a CEO, right? I, I was pretty much doing every activity under the sun that related to acquiring multi-unit properties. But this is the kicker. As you're performing these activities, you have to document every step that you do. Get it on paper. So when you look at your processes, then you might say, hold on, why am I doing this? This doesn't make any sense. Let, this is a seven step process. Maybe I can condense this to four steps. Or you know what? Maybe this one process is actually 
not just one process, it should be broken down to two subtasks. So let me break that down. So as you document what you do, then when it's time to hire someone, you can now provide them with a training manual of how to perform a certain task, such as, let's say, phase one, find the money. Well, what are the subtasks that go under find the money? Well, I need to see what, how much down payment I'm bringing to the table. I got to see what's the minimum payment if I'm using business credit on that minimum, minimum credit card payment. I got to see the seller financing. If I negotiated that, what are the terms? What's the interest rate? When do I got to pay this person back? How does that affect the cash flow? Oh, I got to talk to a mortgage company. Okay. Am I going to go with a, a mortgage lender or a mortgage broker? What are the interest rates nowadays? So you see there's a bunch of other tasks that you have to document, and then you can train a new hire on how to perform those tasks. So I would say start off with tasks that the processes are ironclad, outlined, documented on paper, and you can train someone to do it. And then the next thing is you have to track the results. So just because you trained them and gave them a training manual doesn't mean they'll still do it to the, to the degree that you trained them. You have That's to fine. track the results, right? You have to audit their work. You have to monitor their performance, right? So you have to elevate from being self-employed a uh, technician, in other words, doing everything under the sun to now becoming a manager. So there's levels to it. Now you're a manager because you're managing processes and you're managing people. Then once you graduate from that, where you're able to manage all the different phases I just outlined, find the money, find a deal and so forth, then you can truly become where you're no longer managing and you're no longer doing a day-to-day task because you have a team in place who are operating all of your systems and your processes. And like you said, man, you know, think of it like a McDonald's. You want to simplify your systems and processes in such a way that anybody can be able to uh, understand what the systems and processes are and be able to operate your business for you. And you don't want to give too many tasks to the one person, right? You want to spread it out. So that's how you build bigger teams. Uh, so, for example, um, Henry Ford, from, from what I understand, they invented the, um, what do you call it? the assembly line, right? Yeah. You have the assembly line. One person put on the nuts. The other one put on the bolt. The other one tightened it up. The other one uh, put on the wheel. The other, you know, so it was one person doing one thing at a time, and they became great at the one thing. So if you have a, a manager that's focusing on finding, let's say, apartment buildings for you, let them focus on finding apartment buildings. If you have someone that's good at renting out the apartment buildings, let them focus on that. But you create systems and processes. You, you simplify it in such a way to where anybody can do their job and be successful at it. Is that about right, Juan? You got it right on the head. And I'll just add and just make sure they have the competency and capacity to do it. Meaning if it's sales, right? Or let's say you're doing your search for deals. And we, I have someone actually I'm training now. Uh, she's she's going to be my, my deal specialist. So she's actively searching for deals for us. So with that role, I need to make sure she has that competency of being more of an admin, detail-oriented, analytical type of person. Now, this person is like a happy-go-lucky person, likes to party, hang out, like to socialize. That person, I might want to have them speak with like motivated sellers or agents to gain rapport to sell them on the business with us. But that might not be a good person that I may need just to do that analytical data entry deal analysis aspect. So you got to make sure you, you, you pair the right personality with the right process that needs to be done. That's a more of a manager aspect. Excellent, man. So really, you know, just kind of gearing this conversation toward uh, what we're going uh, off of today. Um, if you guys are listening, Really what we're talking about is automating an apartment building type of business where you can build passive income. You're literally building passive income off of other people's efforts, off of automated efforts. If you can get to that point, when you get to that point in your business, what, what are some of the benefits of it, Juan? Oh man, you, you get to kick back. <laughs> but, right. but not to the point where you lose sight you know, you take your eyes off the wheel. Of course, you still have to check in. It's your business, right? Even though it may be automated, you still have to check in, make sure all the wheels are turning. Right. But that does give you some breathing room 
to now have shiny object syndrome. That's right. You have that one business automated and you can say, okay, cool. Got this thing on autopilot. Let me pick up this other business or venture that I always had a passion for. That's the key thing. You have to make sure it's productive, it's performing without your physical presence. Then you can go on to the next shiny object. Love it, man. Love that. Love that a lot, man. Because at the end of the day, we can do multiple things, but let's focus on the one thing, get the bag first, and then start yeah. focusing on other things at that point. Get the bag in the next thing, so on and so forth. Don't move on to the next step until you get to the bag, right? That's what it's all about. You got to focus, put the blinders on until you get to where you want to go. So in this case, again, we're talking about re residential apartment investing, five to 20 units, automating the process, creating a real business out of it, because it's not a business if you're doing everything. Juan mentioned he was the janitor at first and he was the CEO, right? So in the beginning, you may be the person wearing all the hats at the end of the day, but don't get stuck on keeping all the money for yourself, all right? Give up a little bit in order to gain a lot of time back because once you gain that time back, then you'll be able to do a lot of other things. And with uh, the residential uh, aspect, what we're talking about today, five to 20 units, you build a passive income. So you have the automation on the front end with the passive income on the back end. Then you can do whatever you want with your life at that point. And how long do you think it's going to take for the average person to build a portfolio good enough to be able to, to, to uh, retire or do whatever they want to do with their time, Warren? All right, great question. So just speaking from my experience, it took me four years because the first three years, I was thinking more so residential, self-employed, which is fine. You know, we all get started. But then in my last year, that's when the light bulb went off. Mm. Start being extremely aggressive. So it took me four years and my plan was to buy most unit every six months. So I, I did it in my spare time. I still had my full-time job at the time. So my spare time, nights and weekends, I just bought a property every six months. So that was easy for me to manage. So it really depends on the person. If you want to take my approach, being conservative, slow and steady, just using your spare time, buy multi-unit every six months, then four years. But if you're like, hey, I'm doing this full time, I ain't wasting no time. And I have partners that have additional resources that you can do in much less, maybe even two years or less. So it just depends on your level of assertiveness and what resources you have at your disposal. Awesome, man. Excellent, excellent answer to that question. Another question for you. Obviously, if you had someone to show you how to do this, it can speed up time process for you. How important is that, is that for the average investor? Someone's just getting started and they say, hey, I want to do what Juan does. You know, how important is it to have someone show you how to do it? rather than you trying to figure it out on your own? Oh man, simply put, a mentor is a cheat code to success. The cheat code and the shortcut. That's so if right, you want to, to really go through it, it's best to have a mentor, a consultant, someone to show you the ropes because you can do it by trial and error. Don't get me wrong, but you'll experience a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. And it may take you a longer time frame to get to that road or that, that destination of financial freedom. That's right, man. You know, there's a saying, uh, it takes you 18 years to become an overnight success. But in my opinion, that is true, because it's, it's true in my case, it took me a long time to really understand because I, I was really successful really on and I lost everything because I didn't know what to do with the money. And then yeah. I built it all back up, right? I could have avoided all of that had someone show me how to do it. I didn't have a, a, a coach or a mentor. They didn't exist back then when I first started, like they do today. But the phrase it takes 18 years to become an overnight success can be shortcut, uh, shortcutted in my point and uh, in, in, in my opinion, because you have so many people that can show you how to achieve what you can in 18 years and maybe three to five. Right. So Juan it took him four years. You think he can show you how to get it done in maybe two half the time? Absolutely. It's possible. Right. But it's up to you to put forth the effort, put forth the work and educate yourself. So learn from the expert. You're doing it right now, listening to this podcast. And if our listeners wanted to get more information on how uh, they can work with you or uh, try to get some more information on how to get started in the small apartment world, where should they go, Juan? Oh, great. I have a free training on our website. If you just go to 100percentfinance.com, that's 100 
P-E-R-C-E-N-T, Finance, F-I-N-A-N-C-E-D, WarmersandFinance.com. You get a free webinar that shares with you pretty much the ins and outs of how to acquire multi-unit rental properties, even if your credit may not be to the point where you want it to be, or you might not have the cash as of today. I'll show you how to get started. That's right. Now, like I said in the beginning, um, guys, this is the sequel to our original call that we had. If you want more in-depth information, just like you received on this particular podcast, check out uh, the first podcast Juan and I did on the uh, iTunes network. You can check it on Spotify, across any of the major uh, podcast platforms. It should be available the same day that this drops as well. Uh, We wanted to kind of do an exclusive for you guys, just like we did an exclusive on the other podcast for those platforms as well. So check it out. Uh, go to 100percentfinance.com as well. Check out Juan's information. Uh, he's uh, a beast in what he does right now. He also has a YouTube channel. It's called 100% Finance. Check that out as well. I encourage you. He has a lot of videos, about 150, 160 videos on his, on his uh, page. Uh, tons of information on how you can get started building passive income in your real estate investing business as well. Juan, what are you reading right now? Oh, man. Uh, I, I, I like to read new stuff. I, I recall, man, I got a bookshelf and I have a couple books I haven't read yet. So I say, you know what? Let me pick one of these things up. It's called uh, Data Driven Marketing. So that's what I'm reading it right now. So it, it pretty much shares with you how to market and look at data. And that's important, especially in real estate, right? Uh, especially in your case, you know, wholesaling. You want to make sure that your marketing efforts is producing a rate of return for you. That's right. Right. You want to you want to be wasting money sending out yellow uh, cars if you find out that green has a better response rate or this language, this copy has a better response rate or that dialing maybe give you a better result than uh, driving for dollars. So just basically how to track your marketing efforts. So that way you can start making some sound business decisions off those numbers. Excellent, man. So data driven marketing, I'm going to link that in the uh, description notes of this uh uh, video as well. Uh, you guys definitely check that out. Check out Juan's website. And Juan, any last words for our listeners? Yeah, I have this, uh, uh, what do you call that? Art? Oh, I don't know. It's a poster picture. And then this is escaping me. But it's a quote that I look at every day. It's called, the future depends on today. So if you're looking to have financial freedom in your future, passive income, a real estate portfolio, a real estate business, that future can become a present day reality depends upon what you do today. So don't wait. Well, I got to wait until I find my tax returns and get my tax refund. Or I got to wait until my husband or wife. No, it starts today. Get started today. And you've heard it from the man himself. Listen, guys, uh, if you want to get started uh, acquiring passive income properties, check out Juan's website. At the end of the day, it really does rely on you. And like Juan said, I love that quote, man. The future depends on today. Whatever you do today can dictate what your outcome is going to be tomorrow. So you guys need to take action in order to get massive results. Uh, Juan, man, it's been a real pleasure. I appreciate you jumping on a, on a podcast with us again. Looking forward to doing this again with you sometime in the near future. I'm sure our audience will definitely uh, appreciate that as well. And um, if you guys have any questions for Juan, uh, you can either leave them in the comment section below. I'm going to link his page in the description box so that you can uh, uh, check out his page as well. Visit his uh, website. Do what you need to do, but do something. Get started. That's the only way to get from where you are right now to where you want to go in real estate. I'm going to talk to you guys on the next one. Take care.